Okay. We're good. Um, all right. Um, thank you to everyone who is joining us today, who has been following along and or catching up or will be joining us for the first time ever today. We are thankful for everyone who has been participating and taking part in TM 101. We have made it to our webinar number 12. Um, can't believe we've come this, this long away. Um, feels like just like yesterday um, that we started uh, TM 101, but we're thankful for everyone who's here with us um, and for Mr. Bobby Snyder for joining us today. Um, it is an honor to have you here with us today. Um, and uh, yeah, so here we are starting webinar number 12, with Mr. Bobby Snyder. Henry, do you want to take, take it from here? Thank you. Today's guest has led quite a full circle career. His professional and sometimes contentious reputation has landed him jobs with mega touring acts like Metallica, Jay-Z, and Rihanna. But it's also landed him square in the hospital. His story represents an entire era of crew that put drugs, alcohol, and attitude at the forefront of road life sometimes, and only in more recent years have pivoted to putting their mental and physical health at the core of life, both on and off the road. So live from Oakland, California, let's welcome my friend, Bobby Schneider. Thanks, Bobby. Thanks for joining us. I'm truly, truly humbled and hopefully I won't get emotional, but maybe I will. Um, thank you, Henry. Thanks everybody for having me. Um, and I think this may be a shock for some people that knew me. It might not be a shock for people that know me now, but yes, contentious is probably a good word. Um, I definitely bull, bull shopped, uh, bull in a China shop my way uh, into the industry and through it for many years. And, uh, you know, life's not like that anymore. Um, and uh, I started uh, in my start, I started at about 14. Uh, I knew, already knew what I wanted to do at 13. I went to a show and saw roadie. What did you know? There were roadies, hand a guitar off to somebody. And I thought, I can do that. And I was on a path. Um, but things were very different when I started. I mean, you were, you know, I mean, there's, I think as younger people come around, you know, established things and want to learn, you know, there's always the don't bother me kid thing. That was very prevalent. Uh, and if you were going to be a young kid, even, and I completely lied about my age, everyone thought I was 18. I mean, imagine being hired as a runner called a gopher then and not having a license. So uh, things were different. But anyway, yeah. you had to fight for it. And, and people were, people could be very hard. And the culture, you know, I made some notes. And what I said was the culture was many things. Uh, music was really important, really, really important, much, much more than now. Because, and I thought about that after we met yesterday. And I wanted to stress that although there were contentious times and we paraded around feeling better than everybody and everything else at the, at the, beginning part of it was the love of music. I'm pretty sure that's why, I know that's why I did it. Uh, it wasn't a, a career choice, it chose me, I was, I was driven. I mean, I was, you know, I didn't really do well in school, I did well in what I wanted to, but I didn't, you all know me, I didn't really listen to people very well, and especially teachers, I had a few that maybe helped me along, but this, this career was, and this life was chosen for me as far as I was concerned. And I was lucky enough to have a, a mother who was traveled. She was a handbag buyer. She was, a, you know, woman in, in a male dominated industry, something that's, you know, got some similar paradigms to probably what we'll talk about and what women go through here. I don't know if we'll talk about that today. I'm sure you guys have. Um, and, uh, you know, life, life was different, but I knew what I wanted to do. And, and the culture, besides being the music important, and you were proud of, really proud of who you worked for. I mean, it was like a bunch of little gangs, kind of like, you know, if you worked for this band, maybe the band was in competition with another band. That was the fun part of it. But besides the drugs and the loose um, attitude, because I really want to be politically correct. I'm sure everybody understands that. I want to be respectful. I mean, I did it for the beer, the t-shirts, and the girls, and the music. That was it. That was all I saw. It wasn't a career. It wasn't like, how do I learn how to do this? I mean, once you're in it, you know, you're a young man. Someone said, sure, you can come and lift speakers, or you can come and 
stand on stage. I still can't, I pinch, I could pinch myself today uh, uh, of doing it. And it excites me even talking about it. Um, but it was also, it was also rough. I mean, you know, I think that you, as a, as a youngster, I remember a lot of people, you know, some people maybe took me under their wing. Um, we can talk about mentors. I know that was one of the questions, but the culture was different. Um, I think the culture had, uh, as hard as it was, we were all in it together. And somewhere along the line, somewhere along the way, that kind of changed to we're all in it against each other, I think. There was a lot, became a lot of competition in crews, uh, people fighting for the same job. Um, Why do you think that happened? So Why do you think it was like that? If um, it started about the music and just, you know, having a, a good time doing concerts. What about it in, uh, well, let's paint the picture. What, what year, what era are, are we specifically talking about? So I'm 60, so I started like around 15. So, you know, that's in the, that's in the early 70s, you know, or sort of mid, mid 70s, 76, 77 was the, was the first taste of it I'd had. Okay, that's great. Last week we spoke with Stuart Ross about sort of the, the origins of touring through the 60s. And so this is great to hear about where the 70s and it, and it started to become uh, a, a wider uh, a wider field of, of, uh, of jobs. But uh, uh, it seems like everybody's commonality was that it wasn't a, an industry yet. You guys were, it wasn't the business that we know it today, which is fascinating to me that, you know, this, this era of sort of, uh, of cowboy uh, nature was, um, uh, was, was building the billion dollar industry that we have today. And I mean, did you, did it feel like that at the time that you, did you guys know that you were, I didn't, even think there, I didn't even think about a future. We were doing it. I mean, and talk about cowboys think that every bus we rode around on for years had fucking cowboys and Indians on them. I mean, seriously, there were no, there were no sleek buses. Every single Florida coach had some kind of Western team. I mean, you know, if you think about it, that's really what we were, you know, our cowboys and Indians. And I mean, no one really thought about the future. I mean, there were a few smart people that decided they were going to put some money away. And I'm, you know, I think we were just doing it. I don't know that we really had much of a chance to think about it. Remember, you know, most of the people I was around were, you know, eight, 10 years older than me. No one knew how old I was. Wow. That's crazy. So much has changed then. I mean, I, I love to hear, like we heard some stories from Stuart last week about how it used to be done, but uh, do, do you, can you paint the picture for me a little bit on what, what it was like for you before internet, before the communications that we have now? Like, how did you guys- yeah, Moving past my start of being, you know, the kid on the corner, I, um, out of, so I started, I, I just want to go back. I just want to give props to the place I, I started in it. I went to a uh, prep school, uh, boarding school in a place called Stockbridge, Mass. School I went to was pretty um, advanced and loose. Arl Guthrie went there. And this is in the Berkshires in Western Mass. So I started at a place called Music Inn. Um, and I lived for the first year in, a, in an old clock tower in a barn. We did odd jobs during the week. And my first job in the business was actually directing cars to park. My first claim with fame was Bruce Springsteen and Clarence Clemens driving a van and almost running me over because I tried to get them to the park and they drove right past me. Um, and then through that, um, I think the second year, or maybe even the third year I went back to doing that because uh, it was summers. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the guys I knew, he said, hey, I know a guy in the band, uh, you know, they, they need a drum, he needs a drummer, needs a drum road. Can you do that? I fucking never done it. Of course, sure, I can do it. So those were clubs. And that was very, that was very different on its own. And I, I know that I just wanted to say that. And then moving on to being, uh, you know, to actually being on the road and being on tours and seeing what it was done like. Uh, I mean, and the clubs were clubs. Clubs probably are very similar now. I mean, I think you know, you show up in a van, you know, maybe now it's a bus and a trailer and you play. I mean, it certainly was less, much less sophisticated. But as as I moved into real touring and uh, 
and seeing what it was done like. I mean, look, honestly, in an arena, if you had four trucks, you had a big tour. That was that was a lot, actually. I mean, if you had a truck of sound, maybe, you know, a truck of lights, there weren't really big sets. Um, things were things were very different. No fax machine, no internet, no. I mean, you know, you had like I know what Stuart was talking last week. You know, we had phones in the production office, which were important. I mean, that was your key to even communicating with the outside world, your family. You know, never mind, never mind the business of of running a show. And we used pay phones. Like I had a, we had these. Uh, sprint numbers so you could go up to the you know to a pay phone and you could keep it and pound and you could get more more calls in and I really truly feel that I'm grateful that I learned then when it was difficult because you know Henry think about we've done some tours together haven't we yeah and you know you think at the last minute you could email someone overnight now you could be going to bed right at you finish loadout, it's one in the morning. Oh fuck, I forgot to order the M and M. So you can send a text, you can send an email, and you know what? You'll be expecting that to be there when you walk in in the day. And I mean, so I think you know there was less. I, it was less complicated, so maybe that was easier to do. Mm-hmm. But I think. Uh, Bobby, definitely... I have a, I have a question. Sure. How did you manage when you couldn't communicate in real time like we can now? I mean, the thought, the imagine the thought of advancing with a bag of quarters at a payphone. <laughs> I honestly, it blows my mind. And you know, we need such quick responses these days. How did you manage? Well, you know what? Do we really need quick responses? I think we've kind of built ourselves into quick responses. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. And, and I and I and I will say yeah. this. I will. I mean, I know we're not not talking about our current state of affairs with COVID, but I think if anything good comes out of that of this, maybe we'll remember to be a little gentler. Because do we really need everything we need? Do we? You know. I mean, I think about like calls I make at the last minute because. I, I maybe I didn't have my shit together and I forgot that, oh, we're not going to get there till 10 o'clock. We're not going to get there at eight. I didn't do this. I didn't do that. I think it gives you license to maybe not be lack, not, not to lack, but you know, you can fix it in the end. It's kind of like Google makes everybody a genius, right? Somebody asked a question. You could be in a Facebook conversation. It's not even your conversation. I did it yesterday. Some of you know that I cook, right? So, and if I didn't do this for a living, I'd be cooking somewhere. So there was some, somebody posted something, the recipe looked great. Somebody else asked for the recipe. So, because I wanted to look up the recipe because it looked great. I looked up the recipe, I cut and pasted it and put it back in, in there. So that's the kind of culture we live in now and everything's quick and easy. But I think that I decided even yesterday after we talked that when we go back, I am going to try to bring it back to what it used to be, to really try to be diligent, not be last minute, uh, because if you walk into a place and you really have your shit together and you have everything on a list, whether it's a club, whether it's an arena, whether it's a stadium, there's a guy I worked with uh, many years ago, a mentor, and I'm sure he's still around. I don't know if he's still touring. I'm not really in touch. Uh, Jerry Gillian, one of the OG production managers, I mean, long with the credentials. So at one point I was starting to do promoter reps and stuff. And I knew him from We've Cross Paths. Uh, and he came in and we sat down at breakfast and he pulled his notebook out. And he had and he had a sheet written out with with, you know, all the all the stuff for the day, whether you know it was breakfast with check box marks next to it and boxes and he was old school and I said well didn't we talk about all that he said yeah he said but the way I try to start my day is I ask the promoter rep to meet me at breakfast and I sit with him and I go through everything and that way anything we didn't cover 
we've got a rapport for the day and we're on the same page. And I mean, I, I, I can't say that I've adopted that because I think maybe I forgot about it. But I think maybe that would be, you know, even if you don't actually do that, I think you've got to have that in your bag. I think you've got to, you know, you've got to know what you're doing when you come in. Because as I've been promoter repping and now I produce, you know, some other events where I deal with a lot of young production managers and young, you know, and people doing two or three jobs and friends of the band. I mean, which, look, it's okay, man. I mean, everyone's got to start somewhere. Who gives a shit if you're a friend of the band? Maybe you're good at it, right? I mean, unfortunately, that's a that's a, a title we've given to people that are, aren't good at it, that are only there because they're someone's friend. <clears throat> so, I mean, be prepared. It's not. It's really not. You know what we do isn't that hard. It's not. We. I believe that through all the swirl of the pop stars we work for and the demands that they make and the demands that we think they need and and the whole power struggle, I mean, you know, some of you guys work for some very, very high-end clients. And, you you know, I often wonder if, if I do my television or I do something where I'm in contact with someone's creative director or someone's assistant, mostly assistants, that, you know, have to make all these demands and are so nasty to people. And, you know, I mean, honestly, that's all you remember. And you really wonder, like you've all heard the stories of that someone got, someone at some show got pissed off at the way they were being treated by whoever was making these demands, went to the artist who was unknown to them and said, you know what this person's doing? And I truly think that eight out of 10 times, they would be appalled at how they were represented, truly. And is that really how you want to represent yourself? I mean, this dude, I, I was a fucking asshole for the longest time. And I know where it came from. It didn't come from anywhere but inside myself. I never felt like I should have the keys to the city. And I was always worried about someone taking it away. So that's how I, that's pretty much how I went through. Although I did know what I was doing because I probably wouldn't have been there. And had I just trusted that, it would have been a lot better. And that just adds to the stress. I mean, it's hard enough. You know, you're not sleeping. You're away from home. You're eating shit. You're already not healthy. So to add that factor into it just makes for a contentious day. I don't want to have those anymore. No, I think that's really great advice, man. You know, we we talk so much about the the sort of the, the rough and tough era that you came up in. And, um, and you know, I said yesterday that I, I, I feel fortunate that my generation of touring hasn't come up with that. It, it seeped through the cracks a little bit into our generation of like, that's how it used to be done. But most of all, mostly everybody's cool and calm and collected and just wants to have a good day. Um, but maybe the, uh, that, uh, that entitlement and, and urgency that everybody throws around that, you know, my artist this, my artist that, need it now kind of an attitude is what we're dealing with mostly. But, um, you know, I, I want to go, go forward in your timeline a little bit because we, we understand now where you started. But, like, take me through the 80s and 90s. Like, you started dealing with some bigger shows, some bigger tours. You had a lot more responsibility. What's, what does those decades look like for you? Well, my first tour management job, and we talked about that a little bit yesterday, I had probably done taste of it. I certainly an out and, you know, tried to be large and in charge. And uh, I'd had some experience and uh, I had been mostly a drum roadie and I'd been sound engineer, a few other jobs through clubs. Um, and I got a, I toured with David Bowie as the drum roadie and sort of a stage manager. I didn't really have the title, but I helped run things and learned an incredible amount. And, uh, some point after, I believe right after David Bowie, I got a job with Metallica as the drum roadie, because that's what I had been. They came through Boston. I was a stagehand at a club called The Channel, which some of you may know, props to The Channel. Uh, and a friend of mine was out with them and, you know, uh, uh, actually another mentor. Um, so it turned out that Drum roadie, they had uh, did something a couple of days after they left Boston. They had just seen me, so they called me and I went out. And so I stayed being drum roadie with them for a while. They were 
you know, and it, it was basically club tour. So Howard Unger later, props to Howard, who really taught me a lot, was the tour manager then. He had to go back to Rush. Uh, they were Q Prime Act, and they're, you know, like, who should we hire as a tour manager? And Howard stood up and said, Bobby, I'm going to teach him how to do it. So an afternoon in the Franklin Plaza, he taught me about settlement. I wish I had saved it. He drew a pie and showed me where the money went. You know, I had already had an idea of how to move things around, but I really had no training. And I mean, I was just cast into it. Um, and that was the start of tour managing. And I mean, you know, these, these, those days, I mean, bands did a tremendous amount of press. I mean, there were phoners, there were radio station visits, you know, I mean, now you might do a meet and greet. And again, I don't really tour manage now, so I don't know how busy it is. But with a, with a younger band that's trying to sell records, I mean, so you had different relationships. You had relationships with the record company, all, and, and, and the locals in the record company. You'd meet radio people. But, you know, you were the representative for the band. So if you were, if you were enough of an asshole, I mean, there were stories that if you were, you know, the tour manager was, was rude to the label or, you know, or, or somebody else, you became hard to work with. You know, it affected how the band got treated. It affected how people perceived the band, of course. And I don't know if I went a little off track, Henry, but I mean, that, that was the start of it for me, for tour managing. And I, and I learned how I went. And I mean, those days as a tour manager and with a, with a newer act and Metallica were a newer act. I mean, you were everything in there. Uh, you weren't carrying production, so there wasn't really a production manager. I mean, you, you kind of had your hands in everything. And then it changed with them. They got hugely successful pretty quickly. Um, and honestly, I got a little lost. I didn't really know what my role was anymore. I didn't realize that through the two or three years I had been with them, I'd, I'd helped shape what was going on. I'd been through a death with them, bus accident. Um, I mean, we were, we were all very close. And that's another thing. I think you, I think we all, everybody need, you know, you're, as a youngster going in, if you're friends with the band, don't use that against anybody else. Don't tout that. Don't, don't even put it in your back pocket. You need to separate it. Uh, and don't get, you know, you need to just keep your distance because you got to remember these, these people are your bosses. Maybe they're your friends. Rarely are they your friends. I mean, I don't, I don't say it in a bad way, but you don't really travel in their circles. So I think you need to back off a little bit. Um, if you're, if you're carrying that card. Henry, did I get a little off track? As I sometimes oh, not, at not at all, man. I'm, I'm loving following your, your timeline of things because like it, it was a natural growth that you went through and into tour managing. And I just wanted to hear about, you know, being in charge and responsible for so much. I mean, especially in, in a time when, uh, you know, health and safety was, was not at the forefront of things. Like it blows my mind how it was done um but uh you know now that i know you now like it, it's amazing to to hear more of, of your past but um you know thank you thank you no bobby such a storied career so many amazing amazing artists to talk about so many great things that you've done we talked yesterday just i was curious to know what a pinnacle moment in your you know, you've got so many A-level artists, A-level, that, that drives people nuts, but you've got all these big time acts that you've represented. And we asked yesterday if you could just share with, with us what you thought one of the pinnacles might have been. And I, you didn't get into the story yesterday, but if you would tell yeah. us about that, that very... Uh -huh. Very cool moment. I, I have had a few, but I, I picked out yesterday uh, opening Barclays with Jay Z. Um, it, it came together very quick. I mean, there was this huge, huge design. It was my first time working with Tate, uh, amazing people. And we had a, a 72 foot wide uh, video screen that was hung in the air. Uh, and, and a matching 72 foot wide stage, which was basically a big video screen on the, on the ground. Um, it went through many design changes in, in a very short amount of time just because of the cost of doing it. 
Um, and so here we are, we're loading into Barclay. Now, I, I went through and did a, 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 a walkthrough for the building and they sent me away the first time I went there because I was wearing, it was dead as summer and I was wearing shorts. And because it was a construction site, they didn't, I had to really go back to my car and get pants and change to come back in the building. So that's my first experience. So we load in um, and we are going, so they are, remember, they're still hammering nails. There's dust construction stuff, workmen everywhere. Um, so we're going to load in and we are, the stage is, so they still have the basketball court and uh, or they they because they were working on the lighting for basketball and i'm like what lighting what do, what do you mean you like basketball I just turn the lights on no it's a big deal like there's there's leakos that are focused on the net and you know and all the shots you see in basketball they're lit i mean it's you know it's it's another thing that's developed i mean you know it's its own production anyway so we're going to load in this huge thing which has never even been set up in any kind of production rehearsal i mean you know i'm not even i'm not even sure we ever got it completely set up at tape um into barclays so we load in and we have to work between five in the evening and eight in the morning so you're already at a disadvantage because no matter what you say you're going to sleep you know your arms are accustomed to that i think if people even do that for a living their bodies aren't accustomed to that so they and the parquet stays up so we had the, anything that rolled it had a roll to the side it wasn't like you could fill you know the arena with this big rolling stage and set it up in the middle and again we're doing it for the first time so we get in there the first night we start laying the floor out we realize that there's been a design change that hasn't been communicated um to the rigor uh and you know so we're on the phone we're looking at plans I'm trying, I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to lose two rows of like P1 seats. Like <laughs> they're going to fire me. Like I, how did I let this happen? It wasn't really my fault. So we're sitting there looking at the plans and Craig Getz, who was a Live Nation rep, uh, we, you know, I remember having the plan sort of sitting up against the basketball net or the, you know, the, the tower for the net and, you know, the stage area behind us trying to figure this out on the phone with the guy, the engineer from Tate. And Craig gets, I got to talk to you. I said, can't you see him in the middle of something? He said, I need to talk to you now. You need to come with me. So we walk away and he says to me, well, we got a little problem. Con Ed is paving the road. Like, and if you know, it's Dean Street, which is where the loading is at Barclays. So they shut the street down for two hours. So we couldn't bring the truck in. So in retrospect, it was kind of okay because it gave us time to figure the rigging out. So we figured the rigging out, uh, Con Ed, you know, the, the street gets open. We start to get a truck in. We get a couple of trucks in and one of the elevators breaks. This is, you know, and they, I mean, again, this is, no one's even been in the building. So we kind of get around that. We're using one of the elevators. We're getting trucks in. We're finally getting started. And this is no lie. Con Ed, again, is uh, doing uh, maintenance on the on that area's power and it was scheduled but no one knew it so they shut out uh, all the lights other than the other than the emergency lights in the bowl um and so we got through that to finally so we're sitting in the production office with candles and flashlights we get through that first night uh and then there continues to be rigging issues you know this is this huge 72 foot wide video screen that hangs there's lights that peek through it you know again a lot of design flaws and trying to figure this out in real time with you know with stage hands that are in golden time now because they're in the, it's the middle of the night and it's just expensive so you're just printing money uh bobby question anyway, how, many, how many days before show one was this i think we had about five days but we were also doing rehearsal so uh and we, you know, so we got through the rigging thing. We got, you know, we made the changes. It was, it was a constant challenge. We had the band rehearsing in the gym next door. And then, you know, the band came out on their own. Once, once the show opened, this big TV screen, that was the stage was all covered. And there were louvers or doors that opened. And then the band came out um, 
on, you know, in these windows. What's the, I don't remember what the TV show is. They used to be not dialing for dollars. There was something where all the stars were in these different windows. And is that the Hollywood Squares, know. Bobby? Hollywood Squares. Very Hollywood Squares, right? <laughs> where all the band appear. So finally, this all works. And the afternoon before the first rehearsal, they decide they want to bring in two booms on either side of the stage. So, I mean, it continued. But we did, in, in the end, the show was flawless. I'll tell you the story of starting, actually, um, to, to, to add a caveat. So uh, when Jay started, there was also a door that opened that was on a, um, you know, on, a, on a switch. I still got the, hang on, I'll show you. I saved this thing. That whole first part of that story started giving me so much anxiety. I couldn't this, imagine. I, if I have saved. I don't know who painted it like this, but the whole opening for the show, for the door that Jay-Z walked through was plugged into this, you know, on this second level where the, you know, the, TV, the video went off and the door opened. So this is back there. The only thing that's plugged into it is the door. We tested it. We tested it right before. So what happens then? There's also a, a quick change area just upstage of the door, you know, which you can't see, of course, right? with a tea kettle and you know the all the other shit that was necessary, right? I'll just say that. Uh, which got plugged into this AC strip. And if anyone knows has walked into catering and has tried to make tea and toast at the same time and caterers have plugged that in, it doesn't work. <laughs> so the fucking door doesn't work at the beginning of the show. This is the start of it, right? And we had a manual switch. We opened the door. He came out. He never said a word to me. He was the consummate professional. And that's how we opened the show. And then we did eight nights, eight sold out nights there. And uh, the shows were flawless. I mean, I'm proud of a lot of things, but, you know, that's a, a good example. Like I, I had not done production on that level, right? I had been I'd worked for mid-level bands. I'd been on arena tours as a roadie, as a lighting tech, as, you know, different jobs. I'd been a tour manager for a long time where, you know, we opened bigger tours. So I had an ex uh, experience of it, but that was the biggest thing I'd done. And it was a challenge. So that's, that's probably, if I could pick one thing out, that's probably a pinnacle. That's definitely a pinnacle. What year was that? Barclays, probably 20, 2011, something like that. I'd have to look. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because I feel like the first time I went into Barclays was 2012. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it was 2011. It's understandable how that, that would be, you know, one of the pinnacle moments of your career, um, one of the highlights. Um, if you don't mind, I want to take the conversation to, to, to one of the, the lower moments of your career and, and at a time where you, you hit a turning point. Okay. Could you well, tell us that? Um, sure. And we talked about that yesterday and I'm, I'm, you know, I mean, I'm proud of all these moments, the lows and the highs, because the lows make you stronger. Um, so I worked for, you know, and I don't want to, I don't really want to, no, it's not about dissing anybody. So I, I was working for a company, um, which a lot of people know about, uh, a lot of stress, um, a lot of um, a lot of not really treating people right. And I had been there for a very long time and, and I had been made a, a per, an employee. Um, so it wasn't just, you know, the production manager for, you know, for uh, the group. It was, I was starting Rihanna tour and had been there a long time and I was responsible for way too much. Um, and I was also starting to act like I didn't want to act. I was em emulating things that weren't really in my personality that was, that was truly an abuse of power. I mean, I was, you know, I was not always nice to people. I was stressed all the time. I always felt like I was going to get fired um, if I did something wrong. I didn't realize myself. I didn't even count on my self-worth. I mean, you know, I started hating what I was doing, which, you know, and all of this, somewhat subconsciously. So 
one day on a call, we're still in, in the way beginning stages of rehearsal. And I've been struggling for a while on this and struggling with just the job in general. On a call one day, uh, just especially disturbing, I started feeling like I was having a heart attack. I didn't, it was an anxiety attack in the end, but my palms got sweaty and I got dizzy when I stood up and I had chest pains and like, you know, I just wanted to crawl into a hole. So I hung up from the call and I went in and I told the Live Nation rep, was Keith Keller who took care of me, that I had to go to the hospital. And we were in Allentown in an arena doing, you know, just tech. And I went to this hospital and my blood pressure was, I don't know, 180, 190 over, over some ridiculous 100 or 120. I mean, I was a few points away from them checking me in. And this, this had come at a time recently where some mentors had started to, you know, had passed. Or some of you might know names like Patrick Stansfield, Mo Morrison. I mean, these were relatively young men, I mean, you know, maybe 60, 65. I'm not even sure they were that old. Uh, and, uh, and, I knew, and, and I knew I'd already had a, a, a touch of high blood pressure prior to that. So I just decided to go home. The doctor actually came in and he said to me, if it's that bad for you and this is how you live, you need to go home, you need to see your doctor. And I remember calling my family on the way back to the hotel uh, when the runner came and got me out of the hospital. I was only there for about four hours and telling them I was going to come home and just just release this torrent of tears and stress that had been probably sitting on me for a year and a half. I mean, it was, you know, the, the joke about, you know, losing 40 pounds, you know, chopping your head off and losing 40 pounds of ugly fat. Well, that's exactly what it felt like. It was liberating, really. Um, and that became the journey. That's really when I decided this was work. Um, oh, it was way too important to me because I allowed it to steer me in places I didn't want to be. I mean, I had already, I'd always been interested in spirituality. I'd always been interested in yoga. I had touched on it. Um, I wanted to be a better person. I wanted to be kind. Um, you know, I have a daughter who was at the time, I guess about eight. And I mean, I needed to set an example for her, right? I mean, and I didn't want to be dead. So that, that was it. And I mean, I, it's been, it continues to be a journey. So that was, Let's see, this is 2020, so it's got to be about five years. I'm sorry, I don't run that really chronologically set on dates. But I came home, and there were different struggles then. Do I go back? They wanted me to come back. What was it going to be like? I, I had money issues because I didn't want to go back and go back on this on this yearly deal where I mean, not that anybody, that I was better than anybody, but, you know, I needed to make more than the lighting tech, right? I mean, you know, I was running this huge door. Uh, and in the end, I never went back. Um, I got healthy. Um, I enjoyed life. I took a break, um, you know, and it was liberating. And it, it led to the beginning of a different relationship with work. And Henry, I think the first thing I did uh, out of that, well, actually, we had done Diddy prior to that. But I, I went back to another equally insane circus of uh, working for uh, Diddy, which Henry and I had a couple of tastes of. I'd worked, I'd worked for a man for about 10 years. He's a great guy. Um, and But I, I had a different relationship with that. But, you know, I'm not... I got to admit that every day is, a, is not a struggle, but every day is a learning experience because no matter when you decide that you want to change things, whether it's your diet, whether it's your attitude, whether it's your life practice, um, you all, we all have to realize that, yeah, hey, you have to give yourself a break. You're not going to just, some people maybe can turn on a dime and they're completely different people. I think you want it. You need to want to be different. And then you need to realize that you're not always going to be different every day. That the old 
asshole is going to come out every now and now and then. You're going to get annoyed. You're going to, but you know what? You can go back and apologize. And I think that the longer you start to do this practice that's different than what you've been doing, the easier it gets. It's like muscle memory playing golf. Bobby, I want to I want to just stay in this moment for a second and talk about the fact that you left. And I want to say this to all of the up and coming tour managers. And this goes in line with the show must go on and the sacrifices that we make and the responsibilities that we put on ourselves. And those are heavy responsibilities. But the fact of the matter is you can leave the job. You can put yourself in front of your work, in front of your clients, demands on you. And you can leave that gig. You will work again. There is life after that job, but if there is a, if there is a situation, whether it's with another person that can't be resolved on your tour, whether you're at odds with your client, whether you're at odds with your superior, or whether this job just doesn't fit and your health and your mental well-being are in danger, it is no longer in vogue to just fucking stay there and go down the tubes mentally and emotionally. Right. Life is way more important than this job. I mean, you can't work if you're dead. You can't work if you're sick. Um, It won't last long. Um, I mean, you know, you can put up with a lot as we can put up with a lot as humans. We're very resilient, you know. Um, You can make all kinds of analogies about, you know, it'll be better tomorrow. But I think once I know from experience that once you internally feel like that, once you internally feel like the other shoe is going to drop, um, and it's, you know, it's no different than life in general. I mean, you know, you can, I mean, let's, let's take it out of the music business and let's take it out of touring, but let's, let's talk about your relationships with your spouse or your family or your kid or even your friends, right? It is, it is the basic human law that you are born full of compassion, full of love, full of empathy. Uh, and once that changes, you are starting to fuck with what your true human nature is. That is just the basic truth. And as, as that changes, therefore, so do you. And, you know, having the, have, you know, seeing the, you know, seeing the light shine at a show and being part of it is very exciting, but it's certainly not worth, uh, it's certainly not worth your mental health because it's hard enough, even in, look, we all us on this tour and I'm, I'm lucky enough that I, you know, I, I can't remember doing, I mean, I've done some one bus tours and I've never really done, you know, a, a van and trailer tour, but as you get to that level, you are, you are fighting for survival to a certain degree. And we all, you know, we all live in fight or flight, right? I mean, we are, we are highly, um, you know, at the edge most of the time, right? And I think you, you have to, and people thrive on that to a certain degree. And there's a balance, you know? I mean, you don't choose to do this and expect it to be, you know, um, saying, uh, would you like me to supersize that, sir? Right. I mean, you know, that's a mindless people have to do that job, but, you know, that's a mindless job. And I suppose that if you choose this, you have to realize it comes. There's a lot of advantages. The money's good. In most cases, um, you get to see the world, see the world. They said you'll have fun. They said there's all of that. But the, the truth is, yes, you can leave. You can leave any job. You can leave any relationship um, if it's not good for you. So. It's and, the, and, and the thought and the thought that we're never going to work again if we choose to take a to make a move trust that your good reputation and your good work will follow you if that's what you if, if you've got a, a an amazing track record and there was something that didn't fit with your personal ecology get the fuck out and and I, as i shared yesterday somebody a mentor said to me once 
to remember you're nobody's last resort. You know, you, you may feel like you're the only one that can do this, or you maybe they may try to make you feel like, if you know, this is just not a good fit and you may get some resistance, but you are nobody's last resort. They will find a replacement and and (laughs) it will be fine. And you will find another job that fits better. And Mary Jo, you've had to take a breather for physical reasons. Yeah. A couple of times. Yep. On tour, I, I had shingles. So, uh, and it was a very specific a, a kind stress, of shingles. A stress generated illness. Yes, which is, you know, I was taking antivirals to keep it in check, but really the only way to get it gone to the point where you can then maintain, go back and maintain is just to leave the road for a while. So twice I had to take a year break the first time because it was really bad. And then the second time it flared up about eight years later, I had to take six months off. I had to leave a tour in the middle. Yeah, so it manifests itself in different ways, mental and physical. Uh, it, it shows itself on different people in different manners. Um, I wanted to quickly ask Bobby, uh, thank you for sharing that. That was amazing. And, and I think each of us on the panel and, you know, the experienced touring guys out there will all resonate with a lot of the things that you said there. I wanted to ask you, as somebody who, who has toured through the age of um, zero, let's Having, having started your touring career when you did not have technological aids um, through to the current day, you said something earlier that, that I, I loved. You said Google makes everyone an expert or a genius. And that's, that's a great way to put it. Do you feel with the developments in technology that that's brought an extra stress and strain onto people? Because, you know, as a tour manager, you're you're expected to be accessible almost 24-7 when you're on the road because you have your emails in your pocket, in your bunk next to your head when you're sleeping. Your phone is always there. Email is always there. GPS is always there. Do you feel like um, those ad- advancements in technology have brought an additional stress and strain onto touring professionals? I, I do. I mean, I think it's I'll get to the good side of it. I think the bad side is is it makes you accessible. And it also, you never shut off. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, I can't get into my bunk without my phone being charged. Oh my God, what if my phone's not charged? I mean, I used to wake up fine without a phone in my bunk. I had like an alarm clock or the production manager when I was a roadie would come and stick, you know, his hand in your bunk and get the fuck up. It's time for loading. I mean, I think things were simpler, but you know, the world's not simple now. And what I, what I truly think is I don't, I don't know that we all really utilize the tools that we have to make it easier because they should make it easier. I mean, you know, you're, I mean, I, I don't, I, when I advance tours now, I talk to everybody, but I do a lot of it electronically, but I always follow it up with a phone call because that's, how I was taught and I do a lot of it verbally. Um, I think by having all of these things like, look, let's say that you are in a van tour or, and you're, or it's a self-drive tour, you're, you're maybe you're part of the driving you know, party, right? You're, you're a young tour manager, you've got a couple of roadies, you're all in a van wagon and you've got a trailer, however you're traveling, but <clears throat> you are responsible of getting from point A to point B. Um, used to be, if you did that, you actually used to have directions. You had to learn how to read a map. Um, you had to know how far it was, where you were going to get gas. You know, you had to, you know, when people were going to eat, you had to think about all of these things. I mean, you don't have to think about it now. I mean, I imagine if you're a tour manager with a young band like that, you get everybody up. You might not even have, have looked at your route. You might just, you know, you're you're just used to you getting in. Hey, turn on Waze, right? You're gonna you're gonna have GPS. I don't believe people feel that they need to be as prepared because everything is 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 at a finger's touch, right? You're you're just able to dial it in, and uh, I think that's I think that's degraded what we do. I think it's made it harder, and I hope that people use the tools correctly. Um, to, to aid them, because if you think about it, the fact that you have, excuse me, all of these fantastic tools, you should really have your shit together because you can send everything out to everybody long before you get there. You can follow it up long before you get there. Um, you know, you know your route. I mean, you know what your alternatives are. I mean, you know, 
it, it should make it stress-free, but I think a lot of times it doesn't because I think people just uh, don't recognize the tools they have at hand and what to do with them. Hey, Bobby. So question for you. A lot of us older type touring people, back in the day, we had issues with you know, alcohol or drugs and things like that. Did you have to make that transition? And what is your life like now if you've made any of those type of changes? Oh, I definitely, I mean, I mean, listen, back in the day, you know, in the seventies and the crazy eighties and even, I mean, the seventies, I didn't really see too much of, but I mean, the eighties and the nineties, I mean, dr drugs were the reason we did this. I mean, you know, it, it, you know, you weren't cool if you didn't do blow. And I mean, that, you know, I, I'm sure everybody's heard about, you know, I snorted a Ferrari. Um, and that also added to, certainly added to the, the, the fuel, the fire of not being, uh, you know, not being nice and not being, having your shit together and actually, you know, being able to have your eyes wide open and not to have an attitude. I mean, if you haven't slept, you know, in days, you're obviously, you know, uh, you're obviously not going to be at your back. Uh, you're not even going to be at you. You're, you're probably even worse than your worst. And I, and I mean, it took a lot of people down. It took a lot of bands down. I mean, you know, we, I remember one, my goodness. I remember one tour I did um, in the eighties. Uh, I mean, we, I think we did, it was, wasn't that long. It was four or five weeks. I don't remember on that tour, not doing drugs every day. Like, you know, you just sort of wake up and maybe have your shit together in the morning, get things started, and then we would all start. Uh, and I mean, I was like that for a long time. I mean, I'm, I never went and, I mean, admittedly, I never went and got clean and sober. Um, I just, the, 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 the Coke especially, I never really drank, so unless I did Coke. And eventually it just stopped being fun. I mean, paranoia started no money. And I think all the time I was going, I, re, I clearly remember, I've always journaled, and I clearly remember even in the 80s of living the rock and roll lifestyle and having a, you know, blow in my pocket and being cool about that, always wondering and knowing that that really wasn't the, the path. And um, I don't know, you know, I, I'm trying to think of when I actually stopped that action. It probably wasn't that long ago. I mean, is 2020 yeah maybe it's maybe it's a while maybe it's you know 15 years since i've lived that kind of lifestyle um and i'm better for it but i mean it man it took a lot of people down did that answer the question yeah so what's your life now making that transition from all the coke and some of the alcohol to what do, what have you well, done I'm, kind of i i found yoga. Um, it's a huge, huge part of my life. I try to practice every day. I don't really get the chance to practice on tour. I wish I did. Um, Fitzjoy does. I don't know if he's on today, but um, I, I, have, I have found other avenues. Uh, the last I did, the la we did a Kendrick tour. And as we started getting our shit together, um, all the principals, and I don't mean the principal artists, but the principals like the tour manager and production coordinator and myself, we all took, when I left the building every day and took a 20 minute walk outside. If I could find grass or water or a park, it was all the better if I just walked around the city. And you know what? In the 20 minutes I left, nothing happened. Right. The world did not fall apart. Right. And I was better for it when I came back. Right. We, so, had a, we had a question, Bobby, from from one of our attendees on the on the chat here about tips for decreasing anxiety on the road. And you kind of organically just went there. But the most important thing is that this chicken little, the sky is not going to fall if you take 20 minutes to get your head right. It, it can save, you know, the truth, you know, it can save your life. So taking a walk, 
a little bit of earth, sky, air, water, anything else that you can think of? Much grass. Go sit and go sit in the room. I, I, I know some people that meditate for 10 or 20 minutes. Um, I mean, go open a book. Go, I mean, go call your family. Um, you know, think, think about your kid, walk away. I mean, you know, I, it's, it, there's obviously, you know, we all do different jobs. Most of us on, on this call, at least on the panel, are tour managers, production managers. So you, we don't really get a break. I mean, at least we think we don't get a break, right? Um, you know, we're, we're on point. I mean, I, we load in at seven in the morning as a production manager, seven, eight in the morning. You're in the office all day, right? There's always something to do. You're either dealing with the day's duties, making sure this is right, putting that fire out, making sure you don't have fires in the next city. Maybe you're dealing with the next four. There's always something to do. Um, so, you know, if you are a lighting crew person, backline, um, you know, uh, one of the other, one of the other very important jobs that people perform, you know, you come in and, you know, you get your job done and then basically you have just typically, unless it's a bad day, all those people have some free time. So, you know, you see people that religiously go and have a nap on the bus or they get out of the building and, uh, you know, we don't always, afford, we as in management don't always afford ourselves that break. And people are learning about tour managing. I mean, uh, again, going back to a model that I don't really know that well, but it makes sense that if you're a younger tour manager and you've driven to the city that day, you get to the gig, you're probably at sound check or you're doing press, then you're getting the band ready to go on stage. And then the show happens, you're getting everything ready for them to come off. And then they come off and you've got to get them to the next city or whatever it is. I mean, you don't really, ha you, you can seriously consider that you don't have a break. But what if you said, you know what, I'm going to be offline for 20 minutes. If you, you know, if you absolutely need me, I'll be here, but I need 20 minutes to myself. You'll be a better person for it because I mean, if you, you know, if you think about, we don't follow any OSHA laws, unfortunately, I mean, but, you know, unions do, they have to have their, they have to have their, you know, scheduled meal breaks. And I mean, and you, you know, you pay a penalty if you don't give it to them. There's no penalties for us. Does everyone on this panel eat at their desk? The I road? was just going to say, <laughs> they're honestly taking 15 minutes and getting up from my desk and going and sitting in catering with the crew and having a meal with my people is as as important as you know consuming food to keep you going but just getting away from your desk sitting down and catering because yeah. i can't get to catering i can't have time for a meal ah the box office ah i got all the guests ah the artist oh doors oh sound check you know what get up out of your desk sit you know, down I, for a few minutes have a meal with I, your I, with I, your I'm crew guilty oh and i'm all so of us. so guilty to the point i'm guilty to the point that when we were carrying catering on a couple tours i would talk to the lead caterer and say Hey, if I don't make it to dinner, would you just make me a plate and bring it in? Right. Because I just won't walk away. Right. And oh. and and raise your hand if you're guilty of eating and walking at the same time. Oh, like, yeah. I take plates to front of house all the time, but can't you know. can't just can't even. So the smallest bit, just give yourself 10, 15 minutes to eat some food, have just the being present in your body and having a meal. All right, over to you, Mark Clark. Uh, Bobby, um, I've just been so intrigued and moved by your story. And, you know, we've been navigating it from your earlier days um, to how you've managed to get to your life now and the turning points around that. And some of the most, like, important questions I've always asked, I mean, even when, we were, when Stuart Ross was with us, was the question of mentorship and um, earlier mentors and mentoring young guns now. And this is kind of a two-part question um around mentorship um and for the part two have your mentors and needs for mentorship changed absolutely um it was one of the one of the things i i sat and wrote out um early i i think the relationship is different 
Um, certainly was for me. My early mentors were some tough fucking people. I mean, I learned under some names many of you might not even know. I learned under guys like Keith Kevin and Joe Baptiste and Eric Barrett, Benny Collins, rest in peace, Morris Lida, you know. I mean, these were guys that if you didn't have your shit together right, even not knowing what you were doing, you got read the riot act. And, you know, you the people, they were tough. It was like drill sergeants, really, you know. I mean, maybe there was there was obviously some sort of compassion and, and, and love, but it wasn't gentle. And, you, you know, you had to learn fast. Um, so you, it was a different relationship. Um, but... I mean, I, every, I mean, I, I, there's so many, so many instances. I just want to tell one story. I don't really remember the guy's name, but a very early mentor, it's crazy that I can't remember his name. I was, pro, I was, I think it was my first arena tour working for the headliner. I worked for C Factor. I was a lighting, I was a, a lighting roadie. I don't really like the term tech. Um, I'm proud of roadie. So anyway, we're at Madison Square Garden. I've never even played there before. Um, and, you know, I'm a little nervous. And we go in, and I, I had the shittiest job on the crew. There were, there were six of us, and I was the sixth man. And uh, that crew, I mean, people just wanted to get their personal shit done. There wasn't a lot of orchestrating. Like, if we do it this way, it's going to come together. There was no none of that. And it was like a competition to get your stuff done. And being the young, younger guy and the newer guy, you know, I mean, basically I had to get it together. There, were, there wasn't a lot of avenues for me to have. So I remember one day, you know, getting a stage hand to help me with something. And I didn't have my shit together. I couldn't find the box that I needed or I couldn't move it to where it needed to be moved. And he tried to work with me a couple of times and finally looked at me and said, son, he said, you need to, he said, I'm not touching that fucking box again until you get your shit together. He said, when you get your shit together and you know what you need, you come back and find me. He said, but we don't do things twice around here. This is local one, right? You know, I'm, I'm maybe 19, maybe 21. I'm young. I'm like terrified. So I went away for a minute and I thought about what I needed to do and I figured it out. I went back and got him and he helped me. I never forgot that. So, uh, I think there's, there's different kinds of mentorship. There's the practical mentorship that that was. And then there, there, then there is the, the, you know, the guy, the one that the guru, you know, when, if you watch, if you watch police shows, they talk about their rabbi. They always talk about somebody that they can continue to go back to. Well, you know, I didn't really have that because I don't know, maybe we didn't think that was cool. Um, I have that now. Uh, and someone that's very close to me that has helped guide me through um, this whole period of when I finally left and a life change. He, he helps coach me on life. We're friends. We're family. It's a different kind of mentor. I mean, it's almost like, a you know, a big brother, father figure. I mean, that's, that's very special. That's, that's life. That's not someone that gave you a chance on a tour and, you know, and helped you along because it wasn't ever cool to go back in there and go, Hey, I know you hired me to do this, but I really don't know what the fuck I'm doing and what should I be doing. I mean, you you lose face, or at least you think you lose face. You probably really would. So the thing is, you can be vulnerable and you can be honest. And I mean, I've you know, I mean, listen, I I do my best to to mentor people. I I will I will admit that in uh, in the past few years of of maybe choosing people to work with that maybe in, in the end didn't prove to be as quick witted or quick at, or what I, what I expected of them. Um, even recently that I, that I wasn't very uh, kind to them. And I think, you know, I, I, I believe I've made amends and maybe they're listening today. So I'm not going to mention names, but I mean, look, Henry, you've mentored a little bit under me. We go back to the yellow card. I've always tried to be benevolent. And like I said, you know, you, once you start to change, it's not always easy to keep that up. But I, you know, Alex Prince, who works with Henry now, I mean, I, I have always helped guide that kid. And 
he has always been thankful. So I, I think that I get a lot of joy out of that. I think I get a lot of um, someone that I helped along that does better. You know, it's not like you're responsible for them. I mean, but you helped them and you gave them a leg up and they've done well. And I think that's in life, that's as satisfying as doing a two hour loadout. When we met those, those years ago, I, I was like, do you remember that job? I, I had a, I was doing a show at the palace in Hollywood and we also had the tonight show in the same day. Right. So shows were going on. So I needed a little extra help. Uh, and, and Judd White brought you in. I, I, I had heard a little bit of your reputation and I was so scared of you. And I thought that you were coming in to take, take my job, but you walked right into the office and said, I'm Bobby Schneider. What can I do to help you? What can I do to help? And you, I remember I went off to the tonight show and you stayed at the venue and helped just run things there. And, and I'd never forgotten that because you were, you, you, uh, you put yourself under, like you, you empowered me to be the guy to say like, okay, this is what I need done today. I'm, I'm freaking out, but I need your help. Instead of like, I'm the guy that has all this experience. I'm going to come run your show today. And, uh, and that spoke a lot, you know, but, and then years going forward, like when we did the Diddy tour, um, which was only a couple of years ago, I learned from you. I always, I always love to tell this, how I, you showed me how I could uh, think outside the box when it comes to production. There's sort of a set way of things that they come in, you know, rigging, lighting, sound, staging, like it, it's the same, it's the same routine every day, but your, your ability to look outside the box and think, no, you know what, take those two trucks, put them at that other end of the arena and use that loading dock or move that truck over. And it would somehow like save an hour off everyone's time and, and just fix the whole process. And so that was something that I've, uh, I've always been very thankful that, you know, I, I, that I could learn outside the box and think differently because you've the, to you it's second nature, but, um, it's, uh, it's, it's fascinating, but, um, I, I think the, you know, the, what we've been speaking about today is probably the most important lesson we could pass on to, to students or, or anybody in touring that, uh, that putting their, their mental health first is, is the most important thing. So thank you so much. It's the only way you can do your best. You, Bobby. No, it really is. Yeah. 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 And, and Bobby, you, you mean, we've been just talking about your wealth of experiences, both professional and personal and where you've come from, where you're going. What would your be your advice to people just starting in the business? Like if you had to give just a couple top tips, what would you throw out the like first tour? What foundation would you suggest they start building on? Well, I'll tell you, and I, I don't, I believe it's a Maya Angelou quote, but basically it's about that you will be remembered uh, by the last thing you say to people. That it's, you know, I mean, there's so many cliches, but it's more, it's more important to be nice than it is to be important. Just remember that, that you are, they are just humans like you are. You are not saving lives. You are not a heart surgeon. You're not a brain surgeon, you, you know? I mean, we, we might deal with some, you know, crazy situations and and help like that but for the most part i mean look you're coming in you're doing a you know a rock show you're doing a pop show i mean it's entertainment so be kind to people be nice i wasn't for the longest time i just wasn't but it didn't it didn't work for me and you know that's what i try to practice now um i'm, I'm very lucky now i've been fired many times and i don't believe i was ever fired because i did a shitty job because i think I know I'm good at what I do, but I think I, I, I know I was fired because I had an attitude or I was nasty to people or I yelled at people. And I've had more opportunities and more chances. I started thinking after the meeting yesterday about all these opportunities I've given, all these people that have given me the keys to the city where I let them down. And mostly I let myself down. So look, you know what? Don't let yourself down. You're, this is supposed to be fun. I mean, this, this is a fun job. You're, we're, we are lucky to do this job. This is fortunate. I mean, you know, it has its pitfalls. But just remember, you chose to be here. You chose to be away from home. You're going to have bad days, but everybody else has bad days too. 
and you don't really know what other people are thinking. And there's a there's a book I read every day. I read the four agreements, a passage from it every day. It's something that I that I follow my life. I'm sure no one can see the tattoo or read it, but basically it's, you know, that you uh, are impeccable with your word. You don't take anything personally. Um, you don't make any assumptions and you always do your best. And I mean, it's given me chills talking about it. <laughs> I'm sure there might be some old school people listening to this going what the fuck happened to him um but i'm proud of my life now i mean i'm you know what i've made lots of mistakes i'm happy to share with anybody any of the mistakes i made i don't hide anything anymore and God, I, I i like getting up now well i know if you and them whose tour i would rather be on <laughs> <laughs> Bobby, uh, I'd love I'd love to get that book uh, as like a, re a recommendation as well. If we maybe maybe we'd be able to share with our students, It'd be a, kind of a nice book to share. You mentioned it several times. Yeah, it is really um, fantastic. I just picked it up. It is it's great. And and I will listen. I I don't know what the what the continuation of this is from younger people or you know that that might need some advice or might need a mentor, but you know, and I don't know if they email into you or uh, how it works, but look, I got a lot of, we all got a lot of time on our hands. So I'm gonna open up that if anybody that's listening today feels like they wanna ask me a direct question or get in touch, I mean, I don't know how that works, but go for it, happy to help. Um, guys, if you've been following us, you know that you're able to contact us um, in any, obviously through our socials or through the webinar. And then if you do go to our website, please just subject header to Bobby or, you know, in any way, just let us know and we can direct questions and kind of make sure that y'all are hitting the questions uh, directly to Bobby. So, yeah, it's an easy, easy way to do that. And we have our Q&A as well. Henry, do you want to want to see what kind of questions we have? Well, you know, I... Bobby, we have a, do you mind guys if I launch to questions? Are we good? Sure. Yep, we got a question from Greg Miller, who was a production manager at the Essence Fest when you came in with Diddy. I think I think I was there that year too. Oh yeah, right? <laughs> I think we talked about that. Yeah, we did. Um, can you talk about your approach when the show is not exclusively yours and you're part of a larger show like a festival? Oh yeah, when that's you, a, when you that's come a, in, a, when you got to come in swinging with an act the size of Diddy, but it's not your show exclusively. That's a great question. Well, I, you know what? I distinctly remember that show, and I remember there were. It was the first year of Essence that it went to different uh, different production company. Uh, it was the first year that um, that I, I so I, I can't remember. I remember Greg. Um, but basically, and that was a huge show. And we, you know, with, with Diddy, you know, you're, it's, it's, it's interesting. There's a lot of last minute changes. There's a lot of people telling you what he needs. Um, and there was a lot of pressure to, to get that right. And a lot of, uh, you know, I, would, I would say a lot of uh, chaos. The man loves chaos. Um, so when you go into a show like that or, or any festival situation, you know, and, and you're, you know, used to getting everything you want, I think, I remember being very humble at that show or trying to be. I remember really trying to, to not, you know, scream and yell at people and force the issue. Because <clears throat> I think in a situation like that, you're being humble and, and trying to realize that this guy you're dealing with, whether it's Greg Miller or any other production manager is dictated by what the festival wants, what the festival needs are, the other hundred bands that are on it. I mean, you might be the headliner, but so what? I mean, you're to, to the festival, maybe you're the headliner, so you're gonna get better dressing room and you're gonna get to load in and program light. But what if you're not? I mean, you know, I mean, what if you're just a band on, on the thing and you know, you, you're told you're not going to get this, you're not going to get that. So I think it's a combination. I think you've got to come in swinging. 
you got to know what you need, but I think you really got to remember what, what they're up against and just be kind. I mean, your band's going to do your show anyway. Yeah. Doesn't matter if they have all the lights. A uh, question from Olga. Do you think there's going to be or should be more mental health professionals on future tours? Do we see any on tours now? She says she's a production coordinator using this downtime to get a little, uh, to get a counseling license because she feels that there is necessary to have a properly trained mental health professional on tour. I think that's interesting. And I think that it's necessary. I'm just not sure. I just don't know where budgets are gonna go in terms of staffing. And while we do feel like, this is my opinion on that one. While we feel like it's necessary, we don't know how that will work budgetarily. Bobby, over to you on what you think about how we work around not having somebody on tour. Well, we never, we never have had anybody. And I think, I know my, uh, my girlfriend is, uh, a, uh, is a mental health therapist. She's a, a clinical social worker. Um, there's a legality involved in that, that you actually couldn't have, unless they were licensed in every state, they actually can't treat you. It's just illegal. And I think there's a, there's a true conflict of interest because if you deal with everyone on a day-to-day -day basis as anybody on the tour dealing with someone else, you're a little too close to the situation to be objective. And I think it would be, I think it could really harm somebody. I mean, as, as tour managers, production managers, even stage managers, you have the term manager in your title, you are looking after people. It is the natural part of the job. So I think more important, and I, you know, I mean, there are some people that are at the forefront of this. I mean, there's a panel, you know, the, the, the web maker, uh, showmaker symposium that Jim Digby and, and Misty run that have some great therapists on there. Mm -hmm. There and and I'm and I'm I know that you guys are are paying attention to that as well, and maybe some of the information that they're providing is on the website. What I think is that you what we all have to do is make it okay for someone to have a bad day. Like you know you 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 want to you don't want to you you want to be open enough that someone can come to you and go, hey I with my partner at home or my kid just got into trouble or you know I'm just having a bad day this is whatever the Miri you don't even maybe you don't even have to have a reason right people want to feel cared for so we as touring professionals that are at management level have to take that on but you know what I've had plenty of talks with people about my advice I mean you know maybe I'm older or maybe I've lived through it but if somebody really needs true mental health or addiction or issues like that, I think you got to lead them to the professionals. And there are so many resources now. Uh, last week I heard about this, and I think I knew of the company, but I didn't know what they did called behind the scenes. So they've set something up now where it's a peer to peer. And again, I'll we, we should connect this and should put it on because I think this is really important. They've set up a peer-to-peer -peer thing to where 24 hours a day, you, and, and it's free for now. I think they're going to charge like $99 a year to be part of this. Or I, I read it briefly yesterday that you can actually go on and find someone to talk to that's probably a peer, and it's anonymous. You don't really know who they are. They don't really know who you are. So you're able just to talk because I will say that for me, all the struggles I had when I was doing all the coke and I really didn't want to be doing that, but I felt like I had, I, I didn't really know my way out or I was having trouble on a tour and I knew, you know, that I wasn't doing a great job and I was very hard on myself and, uh, couple of those situations had I had I reached out to someone and said hey I don't know what's going on but this is what's happening to me and I don't really know what to do maybe you just have someone that's objective but and and if it's maybe it's a serious 
mental health issue. You know, people have anxiety. I mean, you know, uh, it is it is a crazy world we live in now. You know, I I think back when everything was cowboyish, and you know, in the early days, you know, the world wasn't the same. I mean, you didn't get the news the way you get the news. There weren't the same problems. I mean, you know, uh, it, it it was a it was a happier, simpler place. It wasn't that long ago. So I don't agree with having someone on the road, but I agree with we need to arm ourselves and need to let her, I do a pre-tour speech, you know, with everybody. And one of the things I say now is that if you have a problem and you need help, you need to, you know, please feel free. My door is always open. But now what I'm going to add to that speech is my door is always open to lead you to places to where you can get some help. And if you need something, let me know. And you need to be open to it because Back in the day, if you were weak, you got chastised. You need to let people know they're not going to get chastised anymore. Right. Um, Misty Roberts has been working very hard for the last year or so and is doing so via their Showmaker Symposium platform, basically looking to remove the stigma of needing a mental health break or needing a little bit of help. You know, this cowboy situation was great while it was working, but we are faced with a lot of different heavy duty complications. Our lives are intrinsically more difficult than they were 10, 20, 30 years ago, just by virtue of the fact of where we are, the state of the world currently. So yeah, we're out in it. Uh, we are out in it more exposed. And look, just to touch on you know, just to touch on where we are as an industry now, we are not tackling those issues in this group because we're going with what we know and we're disseminating information. But what has become painfully obvious to us all is that we gave everything we could possibly give and we gave and gave and gave and we ran and ran and ran and we spent all of our time protecting our jobs and our clients. And we forgot that there might come a time where we needed to protect ourselves. That's so correct. Here yeah. we are. And here we are. Yes. So I think as a whole, as we move forward in this industry, we're going to have to look out for one another and we're going to have to look out for ourselves as an industry in a different way. And, and I think, as we wrap, I think it would be super nice um, if each of us maybe took a moment to share with our attendees how we, you know, a thing or two that we do on the road to keep ourselves together. I mentioned that I get up and go to catering. I get up and walk out to front of house. I get up and go see my crew. My, I get up and go up to the stage during sound check. For me, Going up to soundcheck and hearing my band slam out some vamping mm -hmm. while they're getting ready for the pop star to come in reminds <laughs> me of the passion that I have for music and how grateful I am to be able to work with amazing people. I take a lot of pride in, in doing team building stuff on days off when we can, not putting any pressure on, on my crews, but just, hey, we're gonna post up at so-and-so spot. Come out and let me buy you a beverage, alcohol or not. First round's on me, have a nosh, meet your friends, okay? So that those are mine. And I also use some, I've got some emergency apps. I suffer from anxiety. If it gets crazy and I feel like I'm being overwhelmed, there was a guy who gave me, almost nearly gave me a heart attack on a tour. And I was sitting in the jump seat, pulling away from a gig, feeling like my heart was beating out of my chest. And I learned some calming, breathing, short meditational exercises to do when I am in a personal meltdown quietly in the jump seat. Okay. So reach out. We all have a thing. Everybody, let's everybody take a moment and give a tip. Henry, go you. Um, well, you know, I've heard so many people talk about going for walks and I love to do that. Getting outside and, and some exercise is definitely one that you can easily implement. Um, and then 
personally, I think I maybe stole this from five one, but when I go to catering and the act of going to catering is, is great in itself, but I turn my radio off while I'm sitting down to eat, you know, I turn it off and at least my, my coordinator, my, my crew knows just for that time, Henry's unavailable. He'll be with you in 30 minutes or so after I eat. And, and that's very valuable. Those, those little things that I do are, um, are, are a huge thing for myself personally. And then, um, but for my crew, um, I also, I, like you said, I like to plan those sort of what I call family fun days, looking forward to days off where I can get everyone together and hang out. Cause you know, maybe that doesn't happen so often. It's different than just seeing each other on the bus, you know, having some interaction is, is a good thing for, for morale. So those are my tips. Where, where are we going in line? I would say, I'll, I'll just, I'll pick it up from here. I would say I, I would always like to figure out where the shower was first thing in the morning. I just had to get my shower first and it was just something of just being refreshed. I didn't care what happened during that day. I could live in the office for 24 hours, but I know if I got my shower and got that time to just refresh, I was oh, yeah. recharged for the day. And, you know, I'd always always make a make a point in the day to do a walk around the venue and check in personally with everyone and see how they're doing. I think that goes a long way and everyone's kind of dealing with their own personal lives on tour, you know, so it, it, it was a nice, nice thing to kind of leave the office and take a walk and just check with everyone and see how everyone's doing. So my biggest two, check with your team every day and see, see how, see how they're doing and uh, find that shower first. Get, get a fresh shower in. It'll, it'll take you through the day. Um, for me, I would say I, I agree. Air. I need to get air. It's so easy to be hermetically sealed in a, in a venue. <laughs> like air and sun. Uh, big one. I also like to just say hi to everybody. Good morning. Like touch base. Sometimes as the tour manager, you're just kind of removed. And it's nice to touch base with people. Um, and that helps me a lot, you know, I look at that as self-care, it's like being connected. Um, another thing that has been so helpful for me is there's this little app, it's called Wobot, like W-O-E-B-O-T. And it was uh, suggested to me by somebody, it was developed by um, uh, researchers at Stanford, by psychologists, and it's like a DIY cognitive behavioral therapy, little check-ins every day. So it's not meant to replace a therapist, but it just sort of like you check in with it. It kind of challenge. It's sort of like um, sort of artificial intelligence, but not really. But it like it has these little tiny conversations with you and can challenge your thinking and just kind of get out of your head. Like when you walk in, it's like, what are you doing today? And you're just like, Ugh, you know, and and it just does these little cognitive behavioral tools. It takes like five minutes and it's like a five minute check in every day. And it's surprisingly effective for getting me out of my head. And I've learned about it about a year ago and it's it's brilliant and I'll, po I'll post the the link and it's free and it was it started as a research project by stanford but it, they just kept it going so it's it's that for me has been like a really good self-care just kind of so um for me it's working out um i up until around six or seven years ago, I was having a real trouble with fatigue. You know, I would eat dinner just around door time. I would eat, especially on arena shows with catering where you can eat. Oh, oh, he froze up. Doug froze. We'll come back. How to tired you. you are. Oh, there. Oh. Oh yeah, sorry, I don't know where you lost me, but we lost you. Well. We lost you at, at dinner at doors, Doug. Okay, so yeah, I would I would eat and then I would hit a wall where I was just completely drained, sitting at my laptop, and you know that's that's to be exhausted on tour is natural, but I couldn't break through this wall, and I started working out every day on a day off, or even if on a, I'm on a theater tour where I maybe my load in might not be until one p.m., I'd get up and go for a run in the morning, and. The difference that made to my sleeping patterns, to my awareness, to my all-round mood on tour was night and day. So I don't, I don't really drink on tour anymore because of that. Because I think you get hit. You know, touring is kind of unique in that you have this big burst of adrenaline at 10 p.m. at night for 90 minutes straight, and then you might, if you're, if you're a crew you then might have to go and do quite intense physical labor for 
an hour, 90 minutes when you're loading out. And then it's 1 a.m. and you're sitting on the bus and you're supposed to go like that and fall asleep. And it's impossible. You can't, you can't switch off like that. So for me, get expending some energy during the day and and you know keeping my body on some sort of routine i would get to the end of the day and actually fall asleep so that was a huge thing for me um no matter how tired i am if i get on a day off i'll get into the hotel first thing i do i'll throw my bag in i'll get changed and i'll go to the gym it might just be 30 minutes on the treadmill but i feel so much better for it afterwards what i do for myself is when i get up in the morning one of the the things that my mentors taught me about venues is walk the venue so you'll know exactly where everything is, you know, like emergency exits, where merch is going to set up, where catering is going to be, check out the, the dressing rooms. And for me, that's just like getting extra steps in during the day. And um, the other thing that I like, I have like this huge database of venue tech kits. And so what I've been doing, and this is something I learned from a good friend of mine, Chris Steinbrink, is I take photos of the venue, of the dressing rooms, the load-in areas, and that's extra steps. And it also gets you out of the venue. And I like to go sit in the sun just for a few minutes. And for my crew, um, I tell them, you know, just take periodic breaks during the day. And if we're playing here in Atlanta and we have like two or three days off, I try to have everyone come over for a pool party at my house just to get out of that monotony of getting off the bus, going into a hotel, leaving the hotel, going to the venue, you know, come over to my house, get in the pool, you know, we're going to order some wings or barbecue and just hang out, you know, it's just going to someone's house on tour is the best, like anyone's house that we can just visit and feel like home for a second or get a home cooked meal. That's always a great thing to do. Oh yeah. Maybe. Ray, Ray Amico just said, bring puppies to the venue. I'm going to, yes. I'm going to get on that wagon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I second that. That's great. I have a puppy writer. I'll share with you that. Uh, oh, I yeah. I'd love to see that. <laughs> I, puppy writer. Let's I, see thought, it. I thought somewhere yeah. there was a list that was going around of charities that will bring puppies to the venue. I know Carrie was, Carrie Tedesco was doing a lot of that on her tours. Oh, that's great. <laughs> These are a lot of really good tips. I hope you guys learned a lot. Uh, obviously, we've learned so much from Bobby and and his his journey over the years. So, Bobby, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you so much, Bobby. Um, yeah, so thank, you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It was great. Great. Thank you, everybody, for listening this yeah, week. I didn't get emotional. I support what you do, and I I really am I'm I'm grateful for being able to talk because I just want to share one last thing. I'm sorry I interrupted you. This is so important and. Uh, what I didn't add is that I, I get, I think I learn, I continue to learn. I learn every day. I don't always get it right, but I try to do the best I can. And in being a mentor, you know, it's two-sided. You, if you mentor people, you are going to realize that A, it will help build your confidence because you're extolling your, your wisdom to somebody else, which means you're reliving it. And, and that's important. Don't forget about your self-worth. It's just a fucking job. So, but have fun. Enjoy it. Touch the grass. Whatever, whatever your, whatever, whatever it is you do to make you happy, keep doing that. That's great. That's a good wise one. words. Thank you so much, Bobby. And to everyone um, who wants to send Bobby something direct, you can email us on our website. You can hit us on our Instagram. Um, there's a handful of ways to reach, reach us. Um, and don't be, um, don't be intimidated or scared to contact any of us. I know we keep saying this at the end of it, but please message us. We love talking about tour management. So message us, send us emails, whatever you got for us, and we'll get back to you. So thank you keep so much. Keep the faith, everybody. Keep the faith. Yeah. And, uh, have a good weekend, but Monday morning, we're right back here for international touring number uh, session number two. We're going to, we're going to cover more of the world. So uh, we'll see you guys here on Monday. Have see you all soon. Hopefully all in person soon. Yeah. Yes. See you later, Bobby. Thank you again.